good day. Uh, I'm Dr. Dalton, and this is my assistant, Epstein. Yo. And today we'll be giving you a brief introduction to a fundamental concept in calculus, uh, namely the notion of the limit. Now, the ancient Greek mathematician Archimedes uh, found the areas of various regions, including, for example, uh, the region under a parabola. Wow, the ancient Greeks did that like way back then? Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. So, now, today we introduce that subject by talking about Riemann sums. So we approximate the region with rectangles. And as we make the rectangles thinner and thinner, the total area of the rectangles gets closer and closer to the area of the region. So then could we say that the area of the region is like the limit of these Riemann sums? Couldn't have said it better myself, Epstein. Cool. Many centuries later, uh, around 1700 CE, uh, Sir Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz, who invented calculus, were interested in uh, several problems, inclu including uh, uh, what we would today call finding the instantaneous velocity of a particle in motion. And this essentially amounts to finding the slope of the tangent line of a certain curve. Now, they did so by approximating the tangent line with secant lines. You can see that as the green point gets closer and closer to the black point, the slope of the secant line gets closer and closer to the slope of the tangent line. So then you could say that the slope of the tangent line is really the limit of the slopes of the secant line. Indeed. Well, that's pretty cool. So the limits come up in two completely different places. They come up in the area of these regions, and then they come up in the slopes of these tangent lines. Ah, integrals and derivatives. Well, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> uh, now, while Newton's techniques, they worked perfectly well in practice, but uh, there were logical difficulties. His computations involved certain infinitesimally small quantities that he called fluxions. And he sometimes treated these fluxions as if they were small positive numbers, but he sometimes treated these fluxions as if they vanished, as if they were equal to zero. Well, I don't get it. Like, Dr. Dalton, how can these fluxions be positive numbers and at the same time be equal to zero? Well, see, they can't, and that's exactly the logical difficulty. Uh, the British philosopher uh, George Berkeley pointed this out in early 1700 when he wrote, and what are these fluxions? Might we say that they are the ghost of departed quantities? Wow, it sounds like this Newton guy was just sort of like waving his hands instead of like giving a real precise definition of limits. Ah, yes, uh, well put. Uh, in fact, calculus lacked a solid logical foundation for over a hundred years. And it wasn't until the early 1800s when Augustine Cauchy and Karl Weierstrass and others uh, came along to give a precise definition of the limit that they put calculus on a solid logical footing. Well, Dr. Dalton, are you going to explain how they did it? Sure. Well, let's look at a function f. So it looks as if when x gets close to c, then the y value gets close to L. So in other words, we might say that the limit as x approaches c of f of x is L. Oh, I get it. You're just saying that f of c is equal to L. No, we want to be a little careful. We don't actually want to plug in x equals c. We want to look at values of x that are close to c, but not actually equal to c. Well, hang on, you're saying close to again, Dr. Dalton. Like, aren't you just sort of waving your hands at the whole thing again? Uh, you're right. And so this is where Cauchy and Weierstrass's idea comes into play. So their idea was, uh, let's put it this way. I can make f of x as close as you want to L by making x close enough to c. So you're saying that you can make f of, f of x as close to L as I want. Well, I want f of x to be this close to L. Okay. So to get f of x that close to L, I need to make x close enough to C. So say this close. See, as long as x is this close to C, then... Oh yeah, then it's going to be that f of x 
is going to be this close to L. Right. So in other words, if you look at the part of the graph of F that lies within my red stripe, well, then it also lies in my blue stripe. Well, that's pretty good, Dr. Dalton, but you win that round. You know, What if I want F of X to be even closer to L? What if I want F of X to be, say, this close to L? Okay, then I make X just a little closer to C, say, this close. Again, if you look at the part of the graph of F that lies within my red stripe, then it also lies in my blue stripe. Oh, I see. But let's try this one more time. What if I want f of x to be super duper close, like this close? Well, again, one more time, I make uh, x super duper close to my c, say this close. Oh, I get it. So you're saying that no matter how close I want f of x to be to l, you can do that by making x close enough to c. That's cool. Uh, can you say that more formally, Epstein? Uh, sure. Uh, that's delightful. Uh, no, I mean, can you say the definition of limit a little more formally? Oh, uh, let's see here. Um, well, it always seems that I start with the distance, which is the distance uh, I want f of x to be close to l. Um, let's call that distance by my favorite Greek letter, epsilon. And then I choose a distance, which I'll call by my favorite Greek letter, delta, and I choose my delta carefully so that as long as the distance from x to c is less than my delta, then the distance from f of x to l is less than my epsilon. And so here now is Cauchy and Weierstrass's rigorous definition of the limit. We say that the limit as x approaches c of f of x is l if for every positive number epsilon there exists a positive number delta such that if x is any number other than c such that the distance from x to c is less than delta then the distance from f of x to l is less than epsilon. You know that's a really delightful definition Dr. Dalton and every good definition deserves a good song. Epstein, my guitar. Thank you. In calculus we learn to find area and the slope of a curve's tangent line. So that's why we need the concept of the limit precisely defined. Newton's logic had a problem, departed quantities, and then a hundred years went by, till Cauchy and Weierstrass made a great new definition. No more waving hands, no waving hands, no waving hands, no more, cause I'll give Epsilon and Delta you'll find and take it to the limit one more time. Take it to the limit. Take it to the limit. Take it to the limit one more time.